Are you a businesswoman who is finding it challenging to get your ideas across and make a point? Welcome to Speakers Who Get Results with Elizabeth Bachman, a podcast dedicated to helping women get the visibility they want, whether making a speech or talking in a meeting. Every week, get valuable lessons from Elizabeth or learn from her roundtable conversations with experts and speakers on how to make a difference, not just a point. On to the show with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. Hello and welcome to Speakers Who Get Results. This is the podcast where we interview leaders from around the world about how you can use your presentation skills to make a difference and actually move your listeners to take action. Another big piece of that is whether they're going to take action or not has to do with how they perceive you. So this is part of our Pride Month, uh, Pride Month series, and my guest is the wonderful Elena Kupek. I'm so excited to have you. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that if you're interested in presentation skills, if you've tuned in because of that, please go take our uh, our free assessment at www.speakforresultsquiz.com. If you're listening to the recording, you can pause the recording, go over, take the assessment, and come back, because that will actually inform the way you hear this. Speakforresultsquiz.com. It takes four minutes, and that's where you can see where you are rocking your presentation skills and where maybe you might want a little bit of support. So, Elena Kupek, thank you so much for joining us, and um, and as those of you who are watching the video can see we had a little technical problem so thank goodness we have cell phones you can call in and get the audio on your cell phone uh, welcome to speakers who get results <clears throat> before we begin i want to talk to you i know that you have a lot to say about uh gender and gender perception in corporate america before we be, but tell me first if you could interview somebody from history, who would it be? What would you ask them? And who should be in the audience? You know, I think the person I would interview um, would be Joan of Arc, and for a number of different reasons. So let me start with the person I would interview, and then who I want in the audience is interesting too, because I think that. Um, Anybody who doesn't come from a diverse background of some type, because I think diversity is extremely misunderstood. And so those who don't come from a diversity background, whether that's racial diversity, religious diversity, um, gender or sexual orientation diversity, they look at the world in a very different way than those of us who um, have come from a diverse background. And so, I think that I would want those folks to, to be in the audience. And why do I say Joan of Arc? Um, you know, Joan of Arc is someone who uh, was a pioneer in many ways. Never mind the fact that we won't go to the end where she was, you know, <laughs> burned on the cross. But if you think about what she did for the country of France and the strong leader that she was and the gender barriers that she broke down in leading, um, leading the revolution that she led there. I think that, you know, she's the first person that I can look back at historical times and, and really point to and say, you know, here's somebody who basically defied cultural norms and basically grew to be revered and grew to um, be able to reach people and change people's perceptions about what a woman can do to be a strong leader. And so I think I'd really love to have the opportunity to, to sit back and, and interview her and, and get into her mind a little bit and, and find out about um, you know, what drove her and how, you know, how did she break through the societal barriers that she may have faced in, in going through and, and accomplishing the amazing work that she did? Never mind how it finished. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, that, you know, that's the thing about you break the barriers and then sometimes you get burned at the stake. It still happens yeah. metaphorically. So, uh, you know, or you get, or you get lynched or whatever. So that, that indeed happens. I forgot to ask you, 
I forgot to talk about your bio. So will we, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it is you are doing now? You are, um, so you now work for Gilead Sciences. Tell us a little bit about who you are and how you got here and what you're doing now, which sure. is very cool. Yeah, so I, I work on the Global Value and Access team at Gilead, which is a, um, a large biotech company here in the Bay Area of California. And what I do is I lead the value and access work for the inflammation part of the company. And I really work on the early stages of um, our discoveries and development programs, so what we call the pipeline. So each day I get up trying to find ways that we can take the incredible science that our scientists have and the, the molecules that they discover and develop and match those with what is the opportunity and the unmet need that patients have around the world. And so my work is a global in nature. And so uh, it's, in essence, it's trying to take what's in the lab, translate it into the patient's needs, find out where's that gap and what's not being satisfied right now by current therapies, looking at what's the pathway for development, ultimately with a goal of trying to make sure it's accessible for the patient. Uh, so it's affordable and accessible that insurance companies cover it and that governments around the world will pay for it. So it's translating the science into markets, essentially. So are you a scientist or a doctor yourself? I am not. I actually, the irony is I have a, a BS degree in political science, which there's some, uh, there's all kinds of jokes that can be made about that. But uh, that's as close to being a scientist as I am. Uh, but I've spent 25 years in the pharma and the biotech space. Um, after I left the Navy as a Naval Intelligence Officer and uh, had really wanted to make a difference in patients' lives and was very thoughtful in choosing this particular sector um, to go to work in 25 years ago when I came in, uh, you know, after I left the Navy. So. so how does Naval Intelligence connect to, or a background in Naval Intelligence, connect mm -hmm. to marketing drugs. I mean, well, good I drugs, think, not um, illegal, legal drugs. Yeah. Listen, marketing legal drugs. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, when I was getting out of the Navy, I had you know, many choices ahead of me. As a junior military officer, you're very sought after by a lot of different companies. And I wanted to do something that made a difference in people's lives every day. And I think that, um, you know, having had an opportunity to talk with a number of different companies, a number of different sectors, I wanted to go to work every day trying to make the world a better place and to help other people. And every day for the past 25 years I've been in this industry, that's been the goal I've had in mind. And I think if you talk to 100 people uh, in, across my industry, you probably 99 would tell you the very same. We're all driven by trying to find new therapies to help patients and help people you know, live longer lives across the globe. And so that's what's driven me um, to be a part of this industry. And, you know, I think where it matches is that, you know, as an intelligence officer in the Navy, I did, had two remits. One was to take strategic intelligence to look at a theater of operations. So, for example, if we were operating in the Persian Gulf, um, which we were back in uh, the mid-90s when we were supporting no-fly zones over Iraq and the aircraft carrier and the, and the Navy fighter squadron that I was a part of, and you had to take the geopolitical environment you were operating in and be able to react to anything that could happen in that whole Middle East on one hand. And on the other hand, I had the job of making sure that I could make sure that the pilots in my squadron went out there, flew their missions, and came home alive. So it was strategic, and it was also tactical. And, and what I've done for the past 25 years, and, and what I do in the role right now, is very strategic and very tactical. It's being able to take complex information from a lot of different sources, and then basically bring that into something that's that tells the story that basically you, you pick out what's the real valuable information and in all of that and then use that to tactically execute a plan so there's a lot of translatable skills between what i did in the navy and what i do now and taking a look at complex environments of markets across the world um, new medicines that we're developing and then thinking about how do we match the medicine to the markets around the world and make them affordable for patients and bring them to patients to help meet their needs I love that because the international communication is a big theme of this podcast and how people, how people pay attention to you around the world. And also you're part of the global value and access team. So you're still working internationally, right? That's correct. Yep. I support um, 
you know, all, all the different geographies around the world. So the US, uh, the EU, you know, Japan, Asia, China, um, all, the, all the markets around the world and trying to look at the complexities, the different ways that medicine is delivered um, in those markets, because I think it's very unique. The US system is completely different than every other system around the world. And yeah. trying to understand what are the drivers in each of those individual markets and how are medicines valued and then reimbursed and then how are they, you know, make, how are they accessible to patients and then thinking about how do we align our medicine to those different markets in a way that can enable the most number of patients to get access to the medicine. You said something once about um, not needing another blood pressure pill or something. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, for a long time um, in our industry, companies would bring medicines to the market because they could, because the scientists had discovered and developed something. So therefore, it would advance through the clinical stages, and then it would come to the market, and the commercial teams would say, okay, we have to find a way to get this to patients. But there was no matching of what the need was in the market to mm -hmm. what the discovery was in the lab. And so what I do is match those two things. And we say, before we get too far into the investment, which typically nowadays it's a billion dollars to bring a drug to the market and to get approved. Before we invest a billion dollars, how do we take a look at the landscape and really make sure there's going to be a landing place for it that's going to really differentiate and help patients? And then we proceed to make the right clinical decisions along the way that helps the maximum number of patients get access to it. And so the worst thing you can do is spend a billion dollars and years of your life investing in something as a company and then find out the last second that when you're on the market that there's no need for it from the patients or from the prescribers around the world who might prescribe it. Oh, that pushes so many buttons for me because uh, themes that have I've been listening to recently. I was just reading a book about... Um, medicine in the early 20th century. And one of the things was that um, the male doctors would operate on poor patients, um, male or female, but the doctors would do their experiments by operating on patients and using them as experimental subjects without actually, without caring whether it would make sense because they were just poor people, so it didn't matter. And um, so this whole thing of figuring out if there's a need first, that's a theme that you've seen that, that is, that's been going on for decades and decades, if not centuries. Well, in fact, what you mentioned just actually kind of reminds me, too, is being a woman who, who is transgender, um, that still was going on very recently and goes on today in the transgender community. Uh, you know, it's only been in the last few years that insurance companies have started to cover a lot of surgeries that transgender patients need. And there was a whole ecosystem of physicians out there who, what I call, I, I use the word prayed uh, upon the community because maybe they were... Um, not able to make it as a surgeon in, in basically uh, get in clients around themselves in their natural markets. And so what they would do is start to do surgeries for transgender people, men and women. And oftentimes their results were horrifying and unsafe, these unsafe practices. Um, people had infections, people died, but it was all cash pay because insurance didn't cover it. So there's no regulation on these surgeons. There was nobody to complain to. It was an agreement between you as a patient and the surgeon. And so, you know, one of the nice things that's happened in the last couple of years, and we still have a long way to go for the community, is that we get all these medical procedures covered by insurance companies. So there's some level of regulation uh, because Otherwise, it basically, it's, it's preying upon the vulnerabilities of the transgender community who are so much of a need to align their physical body to their brain that they're willing to do things out of desperation. And unfortunately, there's a lot of physicians out there who've taken advantage of that desperation um, and had really negative outcomes for people in the community. Yeah, that, and that too has been going on for, for decades, if not centuries. Tell us, please, I'm curious about, this, is, this uh, title of this episode is Gender Perception in Corporate America. You, were, um, you went out there and did your presentations and did your work as a man, and now you're doing it as a woman. How is it different? 
it's night and day difference between how I'm accepted as a woman presenting and how I was accepted previously when I presented as a man. Um, really, I had no idea just how stark the differences were. And I think that um, it's been eye-opening in every way. I still continue to be surprised. Um, I think as a man, you can go out and act with confidence in your interactions with your peers in, in informal leadership and formal leadership opportunities and people automatically assume credibility and respect and um, expect that. What I found as a woman is that you have to earn that twice as hard as I did previously as a man. And a good example that I can think of is after um, I transitioned seven years ago, I had the same manager that, that led me before I transitioned, during my transition and afterwards. And I was a high performer on his team before I transitioned. I became a higher performer after my transition because once you align the mind and the body, amazing things happen. You can be your true self and everything else follows. But at the end of my performance review, after my first year working for him and, and how I appear to the world now as a woman, he sat down with me and he said, you know, you need to tone it down a little bit in, in meetings and in presentations. You, you come across very strong. You come across, um, you know, in ways that, you know, overconfident. And I thought, I haven't changed what's on the inside whatsoever. Mm -hmm. the, the rapper may have changed, right? But how I, like my confidence and my knowledge and my skill set for the same job I did before is the same job I did after. It hasn't changed whatsoever. But how people perceive that confidence now is very different. When it comes from a woman, it's viewed um, skeptically and it's viewed as a challenge to sometimes many men out there. Um, and that's one example, and that was seven years ago. Now let me take you to an example I just had at my end of year performance review this past year. I had a new VP come in that I work for, um, and the only piece of um, constructive criticism was essentially sort of in the same theme. And I had glowing, glowing feedback, you know, exceeding expectations, doing all the right things. My peers that I work with lead informally. They all love me. They all love to work with me. They view my, my knowledge of the subject amazing. Um, but that again, as a confident woman, that I have to be careful that how that's perceived by others. And again, this was a, a woman VP giving me this feedback. And so, it's interesting to me that I've gotten that feedback from a man and gotten that feedback from a woman and that, you know, it's, it's like women are not supposed to be confident. Women are not supposed to be um, experts in their field. Women are not supposed to be, you know, viewed as credible. They're supposed to somehow be, be seen but not heard is the message that, that I've gotten from those two leaders. And it's, it just really speaks to me that the challenge that women have faced for so many years that I had no idea existed, but that I'm sure you as a woman and other women listening to this are maybe not in agreement of, oh yeah, you know, may have gone through the same exact experience. You know, so you've been, you've been male and female, that you are now female. You, you said something once about whether it's hardwired or socialized. What do you think? Is it nature or nurture? Oh, well, being transgender is definitely nature. There's no nurture about it whatsoever. The science really is, um, in the last 10 to 15 years, um, if you really look into the, the science behind what it means to be transgender, it's very conclusive that even though I may have been assigned male at birth, um, but essentially they've studied the brains of transgender people uh, pre-hormone therapy and post-hormone therapy and pre-transition and post-transition. And that the brains of people who are transgender actually image more alike their presenting gender after they transition than they do of their assigned gender at birth. So in my case, my brain has always been a female brain. I've always thought that I should be a woman, even since a young age, since the age of six or seven, prepubescent, pre-hormones and all of that. Um, so the brain didn't match the body. And the science that's come out in the last 10 to 15 years has only confirmed that, um, the imaging studies and other studies, because, you know, like it or not, in utero, we're all female for the first couple of weeks 
of gestation. Mm-hmm. Only when the hormones turn on and bathe the fetus and sort of flip the switch to basically um, give us our later gender, do then those fetuses then change, you know, or, you know, the XY chromosomes come into play. But there's a lot of different chromosomal abnormalities that come into play when people are transgender. There's different way hormones act at different receptors that may not receive the, the different hormones the right way. They may, be not, they may block testosterone, so they're only getting the feminizing hormones. There's all kinds of ways that people are either transgender or intersex. That science, you know, if we're talking about purely scientific discussion, there is no, there's no question whatsoever if you talk to the scientific experts that transgender is nature, but not nurture at all. You know, that's so... However, the way people are perceiving us, that I think is the way we're socialized, right? And they, like your boys are socialized to go out and be brave and girls are socialized to be nice. Right. And, and we're also ex- socialized to expect that from boys or girls. Well, you're exactly right. I think that, you know, I can't go back and, and, and redo the socialization that I missed out on um, for the first 40 years of my life before I transitioned. But I think that there's, there's gender norms that we're all expected to fulfill and that we've all been exposed to our entire lives. And for boys, it's go out there and compete and win and be visible and be present. And for women, you know, in many cases, it's, um, you know, take more more of a back seat to the men in their lives and you know don't go out there and push their career forward you know support that man in their life um so those those socialization norms shape a lot of our perceptions of ourselves and shape a lot of the perceptions that people have of men and women and really you know i think you know only in the last probably 10 years or so we've seen a real sort of breaking down of i think uh, especially the younger generations pushing back against these gender norms um, and really pushing forward in a new way. Um, so I think it's, it's wonderful to see, but there's so much work to be done from where we are now to really get to gender equality. I mean, the, the mountain is high, and we're still at maybe level three of getting there. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a process. So a whole lot of what I do is helping women navigate that tightrope between being respected and being called bossy. So getting what you need to get as um, getting what you need by paying attention to how you're perceived and who do you need to convince and how are they going to perceive you and then speaking in a way that you can do that. It actually reminds me of all my years of 30 years in the opera. We had many, many stories that started, say, with Commedia dell'arte and then 18th and 19th century, um, 18th and 19th century literature that were all about how the woman could persuade the man that what she wanted was her idea. You know, if you think about the Barber of Seville or the Marriage of Figaro or any of that, which comes directly from Commedia dell'arte and so forth, it's about how do you convince the person with power to help you do what you want to do? And it's just changed. It's, it's just changed the costume now. You know, vocabulary is a little different, but it's the same sort of thing. What, what advice could you give to, what advice could you give to the men who would be listening to this? on how to get the most out of their female colleagues? What I would say is really try to understand their perspective and have an ability to empathize with them and get to know what the challenges are that they face um, in their careers. Because I think that a lot of men out there and listen, having been socialized male and worked male the first 40 years, 40 some years of my career, I was really blind to the challenges that women face in the work, workplace. Mm-hmm. There's the systemic barriers, um, systemic barriers to, to women advancing their careers. I mean, 
the company that I work at has goals for women in senior leadership positions. Almost every company I've worked at has had those same goals. What that means is companies have a problem with women getting to the senior levels in a company. And so they're having to actively look at ways of solving that. Well, there's systemic reasons why those, those goals have kept women where they are. And I think it's really trying to, to talk with them and understand what has their personal experience been? What are the barriers that they have faced? Whether it's um, basically not being given the same opportunity to be part of an interviewing pool. Are they interviewing people who look like themselves and act like themselves and come from the same background? Because I think it's proven that people oftentimes hire in their own shadows and they hire in their own circles. Mm -hmm. and so what's the value of having diverse candidate pools when they interview? And diversity can mean gender, it can mean religious, ethnic, you know, work experience. But how do you not rely on your tried and true and really look for ways to strengthen the, the talent that you have around you by bringing people from different perspectives to the table who can look at problems from a very different way and offer, you know, oftentimes offered solutions that may be outside of the norm and make the ultimate solution stronger because of that diversity of input. But I think that really understanding, you know, if you talk to a woman, you ask them, you know, what are the two or three things that have, you feel like have held you back in your career? You're going to get probably an education and some things that you have no idea about. And you probably aren't even aware of some of the systemic challenges that they've faced. And I think if you do that with the different women that you work with and, you know, multiply that times four, five, six, seven, ten, whatever it may be, you're going to be able to grow a much better appreciation for what the challenges they face, but also at the same time, what the strengths that they bring to problem solving. And hopefully you walk away as a stronger ally for women and their opportunities to do bigger and better things in the organization. Yeah, and actually it should be said here that um, diversity, by diversity, I think we both mean racial diversity, ethnic diversity, all sorts of things. I mean, you and I are both, uh, you know, we're both white and blonde. So, uh, you know, our, what makes us different is not visible at the first glance. <clears throat> we could pass, if you will. And um, my friends with darker skins, they will often notice things that I don't notice because, um, I may feel different, but I'm not, I don't necessarily look different. So that's, uh, that's a big deal. I, th one of the things that I'm hoping is the movements nowadays of getting women onto corporate boards, for instance, or getting women into positions of power is just the beginning. Hopefully the women who do get into positions of power Hopefully they're aware enough that once you've got a couple of women up there who have fought to get there, then it is your job, it's your job to open the door for those behind you. Um, it I, is I agree. Just, it is just a start, but thank goodness there's a lot of, of, of uh, progress being made. No, I agree. I think I've encountered two types of women in my career. Those that lift up and empower other women, and which is, I think, what we both see as the ideal, and those who really um, act as mentors and provide that coaching and that support and that pull the others up behind them. But I think I've experienced, and I know others I've talked to have experienced, women who, for whatever reason, um, aren't as maybe helpful and that don't help other women get up there too. And I think that, you know, I think that we can't just assume because it's a woman, they're automatically going to be the same way. Because I think that I've experienced in my career, that about two thirds, maybe those who are supportive. We also have to look at women and say, if we're not doing those things to help support other women, why aren't we? Why aren't we trying to make others around us better and help them tackle the same challenges that we're facing and bring them along with us? I feel like it's a it's a scarcity and a fear thing. So you know, it's, some of it is I got here, but there's only room for me, so I can't let anybody else come in who's good. And you know, or you know, or just seeing other people as a threat, male or female. That's um, okay. a let's hope that can be um, 
minimized as we move forward. We've all we've both certainly seen that and um, and see how how that makes a difference. I think understanding. I was just coaching. Uh, uh, how do I want to put this? I was just coaching a client, a female client, through a to prepare for a meeting with a very difficult female superior. And we talked about understanding and thinking about where the difficult superior might be coming from, and then how could we address her in a way that would support her. And my client was really nervous, but it wound up to be a great interview because we'd come in, she had come in, I'm clearly, I wasn't at the interview, I was the, the coach outside, but she'd come in and had a great conversation because of all the preparation she had done in terms of what does this superior need and how can I address what her needs are so that she understands why we want to do what we want to do. And I just, I just keep coming back. You know, rule number one over and over is it, it's all about them. It's all about your listeners. And how do you phrase something in a way that your listener can get it? Elena Kubek, this has been fascinating and, and exciting. Uh, do you have other thoughts about how to navigate gender perception in corporate America, things that we should know? Well, I think, you know, for me, I have generated, I've grown so much more empathetic um, towards anybody who's not a straight white male, mm -hmm. <laughs> having lost that white male privilege when I transitioned. And I think that, you know, I, I've been at the forefront of advocating for transgender rights outside of the corporate environment, um, mm -hmm. having lived in North Carolina through HB2 and been very involved in the fight for, for equality there and then nationally since there, uh, since that fight is not over when it comes to serving in the military right now, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that for me, it's how do we break through and help others who don't come from a diverse background and don't come look at the world from a female perspective. Um, and how do we help them understand that it's, it's not a fixed piece of the pie. They don't have to give something up for those of uh, us who have both equality to yeah. earn equality. I think that's what we have faced in this country for the past four or five years is that we're facing a large section of people who have a fear of giving something up. And what, mm -hmm. they, that what they may be giving up is a fear of their religious liberties or their way that they see relationships between themselves and others in a heterosexual environment. Um, and I think it's helping people understand that when other people get equality, it doesn't mean that they're losing any equality. It's just helping other people enjoy the same benefits that they themselves have probably blindly been the beneficiary of their entire life, but they've never known that. They don't recognize that because they've never had to look at the world through a, a lens of anything other than somebody of privilege. And mm -hmm. so I think it's by sharing our experiences with others, this is why I've chosen to be visible um, you know, in the community and, and in my workplaces um, for you know, being transgender. It's helping others understand in a way of sharing my life experiences with them. So maybe by sharing something about myself, they will find some seed to grow inside of that other person, that they will then be open to learning about, you know, a different point of view than maybe they've encountered before. And I think if, if we can just stop this, this world of um, constant arguing and bickering and just have a world of dialogue and not threaten somebody's beliefs because they hold them. People are entitled to believe what they want to believe, but hopefully they respect that we're entitled to have different perspectives. But it's the sharing of those perspectives and sharing of ideas and sharing of the uh, experiences that we've had who shaped what we are 
I think we can all grow stronger and better for it. We've just got to try and break through this division and, and try and reach this, this level of dialogue that doesn't seem possible right now. But I'm not going to give up on it. I'm very open about who I am um, in my journey and how I've gotten here and hope that in some small way it's helped others find strength in themselves to move forward um, with accepting who they are and be confident in that way and, and find the strength to live their truth as I've been able to find the strength to leave, leave mine. But and I think it only comes by making people feel, and this is my perspective, um, feel comfortable and not threatened in how you engage and have that dialogue. Because if we engage with hostility, we're going to be met with hostility. If we engage with civility and the sense of trying to understand their perspective and hopes they will understand our own, I think we're more likely to get results. Wow, that's wonderful. Elena Kubek, thank you so much for being a guest yeah. on Speakers Who Get Results. I really, uh, this, this has been fun and fascinating and useful. Um, we're actually recording this on Memorial Day, so I must remember to thank you also for your military service and yeah. for having having done that for the sake of, of the whole country. This has been Speakers Who Get Results. I want to remind you one more time that you can go to our free assessment at speakforresultsquiz.com. That's speakforresultsquiz.com. And that's where you, see, you can see where you are great with your presentation skills and maybe you may, there maybe you might want to get a little bit of support. It only takes four minutes, so give it a chance. If you'd like this, please also like us on iTunes, leave us a review. We're happy to have you here. This has been Elizabeth Bachman. I'll see you on the next one. We have just concluded another great episode of Speakers Who Get Results with your host, Elizabeth Bachman. If you got value from today's episode, please feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues. You may also visit elizabethbachman.com for additional resources. Be sure to tune in every week for new episodes. And thanks for tuning in.